Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Google Hangout this week. Uh, this is a really exciting week for us because it is the first time that one of the many law professors will be joining us directly and live, uh, so available for any email questions we get in, as well as questions uh, from the students who are already online and will be joining our guest. Um, and turns out that most of the leading American law professors really want to join our class, and there, and, and there will be a long line of them. But there is no better person to start with than Mary Wood. Uh, Mary Wood, frankly, is a hero of mine. Uh, she is, without doubt, the leading proponent of a doctrine that I love, called the Public Trust Doctrine, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Uh, Mary is a great lawyer and a great professor. She went to one of the great American law schools, Stanford, practiced law in the Pacific Northwest, uh, and is currently the Philip Knight Professor of Law at the University of Oregon, where she's also a founding director of their nationally famous Environmental and Natural Resources Law Center. Uh, she's the author of two environmental law textbooks. She has won two important teaching awards. And next month, I mean, just in a few days, uh, the University of Cambridge in England Press is publishing her book entitled Nature's Trust. So, Mary, welcome to our class. Oh, wait, we lost her <laughs> after all that. I'll be Mary, since uh, she's my hero. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, uh, we'll wait for Mary to get back on. Um, I will tell you that one of the uh, intriguing premises of her book, probably how her book starts, is that environmental law is broken. That it, in fact, it has devolved into a system in which we give uh, people permission to take apart our environment uh, and the law needs to do something else, something that works. And she has the idea of holding, viewing the environment as a trust that governments hold in trust for us. Uh, and the idea of a trust is a very ancient uh, doctrine in all of law. And many people are charged with administering trusts and having fiduciary obligations toward it special obligations uh, to administer it for the benefit of those of us who are supposed to be its beneficiaries. So when Mary does get back on, uh, I'll let her speak for herself. Uh, while we are waiting, though, why don't we introduce our the students who are here? Why don't we uh, say hello to them and let them introduce themselves? Carmen, why don't we start with you? Hi. I'm. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm Carmen Skarlupka. I live in Deal, Maryland, just outside of the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., in the United States. And um, I'm currently a student. And oh, the other thing that I probably do that's my big environmental piece is I am the EPA volunteer coordinator for their high watermark, which is about sea level rise implications, um, since I'm a coastal community on the Chesapeake Bay. And uh, so sea level rise is, is a big part of my, let's say, my professional focus. That's great. Well, Carmen, welcome to, uh, to be a member of us. Kati. Hi, I'm Kati Novak. I'm originally from Hungary. I have a law background. I studied law in um, the, the UK. And um, I also studied a variety of um, other legal systems uh, during my master's program. Um, I don't have an environmental law background because I had a very limited um, elective options when I was at university, so I thought this would be a perfect time to sort of expand my knowledge into an area that I'm interested in. I'm also taking a climate change course on Coursera, so I thought the two would really complement each other. Uh, and you are, but you are right now in Hungary. Yes. What's the weather like? Cold. Unusually oh. so. So I'm wearing a thick sweater. So. <laughs> <laughs> and we have in Venezuela, Yuli. Hi, I'm Yuli Guarino from Venezuela, Marlina. And I'm really glad to be here. I'm a student of law school. And thank you. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say. I'm really glad. I'm excited to just talk to you. Thank you. 
Yuli, we're delighted uh, you are here. Uh, you know, while we're waiting, I, I did receive a question. Actually, Yuli, it's from, uh, it involves South America, and I'll just uh, put it out and, and tell you what the question was and what I know about it. Uh, but it was from Mario, who posted uh, a question that had to do uh, with Bolivia, and in particular, the idea of building a road through a part of the Amazon forest where there are indigenous tribes. Uh, this actually is a road, I believe, that's uh, wanted mostly by Brazilian interests, but across the Bolivian rainforest. Uh, and the question was the extent to which indigenous tribes there uh, had legal rights uh, that they might be able to exercise uh, and uh, maybe get some change in the government's policy. Their fear, of course, is that once the road is built, it will lead to development, illegal squatting, uh, and in many ways the destruction of tribal lands, indigenous lands. So I, uh, I knew a little about this, and I'll be interested when, and when we get Mary Wood back on the phone. Mary Wood and I both practiced American Indian law uh, at various times in our backgrounds. So we know a little bit about indigenous rights. And in my understanding in, uh, as to Bolivian law is that they do at least have a Bolivian constitutional right to consultation. It isn't clear to me what that involves as a matter of Bolivian rights. But it is also my understanding that a few years ago, uh, there were severe protests and the government began consulting with them. Uh, and that, in fact, the road might be moved away from their particular tribal lands into other lands. Not that that solves the problem in those other lands. But I see Mary is back with us. Mary, can you hear me? I think Mary is talking to Will, our technical assistant, on getting hooked up. Uh, but you can see Mary at the bottom there. I think she's at her home in or Eugene, Oregon, which is a beautiful part of the United States. So I'll let Mary work out with Will the technical issues. Uh, but Mario I uh, and, and others can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is there was a little bit of adjustment. And there was a huge political protest, a walk, in fact, uh, to protest this Amazonian road. Uh, and it was successful. And sometimes that's my experience, too. When the law isn't clear, it's important and often necessary for people to make their views known directly and politically. Uh, and it paid off in this case. So I'll wait for Mary to get reconnected. Okay. Oh, she's on. I'm reconnected. I'll hang up with, with Will. All right. Okay. Mary, Hi, you missed. Hi. <laughs> Mary, you left. You, you missed my big send up. Uh, but <laughs> as I told everybody, uh, in addition to all of your accomplishments, you are my hero. Ah, oh, um, thank you. You also have this incredible book, Nature's Trust, coming out next month by Cambridge University Press. Mary, it starts with the premise that the environmental law we have is broken. Could you expound on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I'm delighted to join this class. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. Environmental law is, uh, I say it's broken because I've been teaching it for over 20 years, and I've noticed a pattern across state and federal agencies in this country and also other countries, and that is that the agencies that implement the statutes um, overridingly use the statutes as permit provisions to allow the damage that the statutes seek to prevent. And we know that these statutes have permit provisions, but what the agencies have done is taken what is essentially a protective regime and turned it into a permitting regime. And they do that because they have a lot of discretion under environmental law and they actually get lobbied quite a bit from industrial interests and from moneyed interests. Um, and so every big industry has quite a bit of resources that it promotes uh, environmental damage with in the agencies. And so well, whereas we think of the environmental statutes as protecting our resources, in effect, the agencies are using them to just permit cumulative mounting damage. And that's really becoming unacceptable because 
across the board our resources are declining to um, a point where they're not going to be able to sustain the uh, level of society that we're used to. So that is why I wrote my book. Um, I felt that something was terribly wrong with environmental law the way it was implemented. Mary, tell us about the public trust as an alternative regime, uh, how it could address it, and why it also won't be watered down by special interests. Well, I, I can make no promises. Um, the public trust is not really an alternate regime at all. I wrote my book just to highlight the trust as the real purpose of environmental law and a framework that we should use to think about um, whether agency action is appropriate. And so the trust isn't an alternative at all. In fact, I'm, um, I've never suggested we get rid of our environmental statutes. I'm just saying that the trust should be thought of to infuse an obligation in this vast window of discretion that agencies seem to have now. So agencies, when they implement environmental laws, have a lot of discretion. And we assume that agencies will implement the laws in an objective, fair-minded manner that promotes the purposes of the statutes. And increasingly, they have not done that. And so the trust is a reminder of the very purpose of environmental law. It's the basis of environmental law. So I wrote my book to highlight that as not a different frame, but an underlying frame that we should, we should remember and we should hold agencies accountable for this. Now, having said that, there's also the sense of how do you enforce protective obligations against agencies? And so the trust is a principle that courts use to scrutinize agency action a little bit more and to make sure that agencies are um, doing right by the public and protecting resources for the public. So it is a legal doctrine, but, but I wrote my book really to remind us all of the frame um, in which these agencies are supposed to operate. Mary, I had my students uh, this week read the National Audubon Society uh, versus City of Los Angeles case, uh, where, in fact, the California Supreme Court, just as you suggested, uh, reminded the California Water Agency about its public trust obligations. Can you say a little bit about that? Is that the sort of case and the sort of, of underlying emphasis that you have in mind? Yes, that's, um, that's precisely right. Uh, the, that case is a, a leading, we say, landmark case in public trust law. And there you had a statutory scheme that allocated water. And what was happening was that the water agency in California was just allocating so much water that was depleting the um, tributary that goes into Mono Lake. And so that is um, exactly the type of situation we're facing across the board today. And the court said, hey, you can't just keep allocating water, you've got to consider the public trust as well in your water allocations. And it, the court didn't say um, that any particular regime was mandatory. The court left it to the water agency but said you've got to look over these permits again and make sure you're protecting the resource. The whole, the whole purpose of the public trust, you see, is to protect resources for present and future generations. So we don't deplete all of our resources in one generation, which we're at risk of, of, of doing. We're heading on that path right now. Um, and so the court just said, you've got to, as a water agency, remember that this is a trust. It's, it's basically, the court didn't say this, but it's basically wealth for the public, ecological wealth, that's supposed to continue on through the generations. And um, so it remanded to the agency to figure that out. That's exactly the type of case that would be useful today, perhaps in the pollution context. Um, so, yeah, it's a landmark case, and it, it demonstrates the public trust quite well. Mary, in the, in the upcoming book or in your other writings, have you found courts in other countries other than the United States that rely on something like a public trust idea to underscore the continuing obligation of regulators uh, to do the right thing, do what these laws are supposed to do. Yes, um, the public trust is very strong in many countries, uh, South Africa, India, the Philippines, and other countries as well. One of my favorite cases is a rather recent case from the Philippines, and it involves the pollution of Manila Bay. 
And um, Manila Bay is a huge expanse of water, and it receives all the contamination from the watershed. And it has become so degraded and contaminated that people can't safely swim in the bay anymore. They can't safely fish. And yet, there are over a dozen environmental laws designed to protect this bay, and they've been on the books for years and years. And in this case, children of the Philippines with their parents brought suit against, I think, 12 agencies saying, you have a trust obligation to protect and clean up this bay according to statute. And the Supreme Court of the Philippines said, yes, you do. You have a trust obligation to carry out these statutes. And this is so similar to the situation in, in the United States because the agencies were all arguing that they had discretion pretty much not to implement um, the, uh, the environmental statutes because there was so much interpretation room. And the court said, no, you've got to create a plan and implement the plan. And the court said, we're going to supervise that implementation over the next few years to make sure you actually fulfill your obligations. So that was a great case, I think, because the um, Supreme Court actually realized that the agencies are skirting their obligations under environmental law, and it used the trust um, to basically say, no, you're obliged under environmental law to save, uh, to preserve this waterway for the benefit of present and future generations. You know, in the United States, at least, uh, there's a, a one of the themes that I talk about in the course is every so often environmental law meets this other body of law, administrative law, uh, which informs generally the way the law looks at agencies in implementing anything, not just environmental law. And one of the watchwords, one of the key themes in administrative law is that agencies in fact do have this discretion and that courts really supervise them to make sure that they don't abuse it, uh, but that the courts themselves don't are very careful, in, in my belief, too careful, not to intrude, especially as to legal understandings. To what extent uh, do you address that in Nature's Trust or your other writings, that is the idea of the public trust as a way of informing agencies at all in tension with the idea in administrative law that we defer mostly to these agencies in their own understanding of the laws they administer? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, agencies have really two types of discretion. One is this discretion you're talking about, which is discretion to take a law and pass regulations that implement the law. And in doing that, um, they make it legal interpretations. But then the other type of discretion is this kind of technical discretion where they take a law um, that allows them to issue permits, but they're supposed to apply certain criteria, like usually it's criteria that are geared towards the safety of, uh, of the, the activity for the public. And so in this realm of technical discretion, what they do is they become very politicized and behind what we might call a facade of science, they actually carry out politicized agendas um, because they they have been um, many agencies have been captivated um, captured by by industries and so there's really two types of discretion here there's the legal discretion in implementing the laws then there's the technical discretion um, both are very much in influenced by industry interests now and so then you introduce the courts as this um, player, the courts are the third branch of government and they are supposed to keep our the other branches in check. But what the courts do is they apply this doctrine of deference and the doctrine of deference simply means the court will not second guess um, what an agency does unless it's just blatantly illegal. Well that has a dysfunctional role and I address it quite a bit in my book because um, agencies use this realm of discretion to become very political in effect and carry out political objectives. And so if the courts aren't going to scrutinize that, the agencies really have no check and we are looking at something close to an administrative tyranny in environmental law. Because if they have no check, um, they, they will act on the basis of more and more power. So I do address that 
the trust is a wake-up call to courts to say, look, you are a third branch of government. The, the agencies already have this trust obligation. It's not something that's recently been introduced. But as trustees, they need judicial accountability. Every trust has a measure of judicial accountability, and judges scrutinize, scrutinize trustees' actions. So, um, so the trust is, in a way, designed to restore the balance of power that has been lost uh, through administrative law. Um, let me ask one last question. This actually came in as an email to me from one of the students in the class. There is, at some point in one of your writings, you talk actually about judges issuing contempt citations to public officials. That's intriguing. Uh, uh, yeah, that's not a big part of the enforcement scheme. Contempt, um, well, contempt of court is a very extraordinary order. It's when a public official has actually violated a court order. I mean, this, there's nothing new with that. They're rarely used, and they should be rarely used. Um, but where, let's say, a, an agency official is violating the law and, and is held accountable in court, and where the court says you must do this, this, and this, and the agency official violates it, agency officials are no more above the law than you or I would be. Um, so contempt of court is not really a, a frequent remedy for anything, um, but it has been used in the environmental context in statutory law. Actually, the head of the Forest Service was um, under a contempt of court order. The head of the Department of Interior was uh, for years under a contempt of court order for failing to, court, to carry out court, um, court mandates. So it's just the, the last final power that a court ever has, but I don't view it as being um, frequently used in any scenario, but it is the final power that a court has over things. Well, you know, at this point, um, I, where I think we're adding one or two other people possibly to the video call. Uh, but uh, this might be a good time while well, those are being added to introduce you to the, the people we do have. I was able to chat with them before you joined. Uh, but uh, we have Carmen from Maryland Hello. and Kati, Hi, from Hi. Kati from Hungary. Hi. Hi. And Yuli from Venezuela. Ah. Good morning. I'm fine. Well, it's um, wonderful to have you all from these different countries. That's terrific. I'm glad to, I'm glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yuli is a, a law student in Venezuela, uh, and Kati herself has legal training. And Carmen is a volunteer coordinator with the EPA in the Chesapeake Bay. That's great. Carmen, uh, what role do you have uh, with the Chesapeake Bay? Um, I have a 20 year background in nonprofit, uh, working with different organizations here on watershed stewardship and advocacy. Um, presently, uh, the FEMA just came out with the new NFIP uh, floodplain. Um, maps that have not actually been released, but they are here. They haven't been finalized. And we're looking at um, some takings going on in the very near future with the Brigert Waters Act, saying that repetitive losses. So uh, we just identified all the new properties that are no longer going to be eligible for uh, flood insurance, and the grant has been authorized for states to allocate funding to go in and buy people's properties from them. On the side, I look at the bigger picture with the watershed stewardship piece with the sea level rise projections and how um, we're everything here is less than seven feet above sea level. So a six foot sea level rise means we're all going to have a very changed environment in the near future. Yeah, and um, so when we get into sea level rise, I think that really demonstrates the consequences of failing to act on carbon dioxide pollution. Um, because sea level rise isn't something we can just walk away from. You know, you, I think you, Carmen, said we'll have a very different life. Sea level rise is, is a real threat 
to massive areas of civilization. And when we talk about climate change and a heating planet and the prospect of runaway heating, in fact, um, we, start, we start realizing the consequences of agencies' failure to regulate. The EPA was directed back in 2007 to deal with carbon dioxide regula uh, regulation, either regulate or say why you're not regulating and give a valid reason. And today, um, it's six years later, and they still have not regulated carbon dioxide pollution. They've passed a couple of regulations that were sort of the easier ones to pass, but they have not created a comprehensive carbon dioxide regulation. Well, when you posit that next to the severe consequences of sea level rise, which um, can hardly even be imagined, I think, that is when the trust comes into full view. The purpose of the trust is simply to say, look, government, if you are out there operating as a manager of resources, you better fulfill your obligation to the public to properly manage those and to protect those for present and future generations. And what we see instead is a lot of catering to industry, which is now going to harm the public terribly in ways that we can't really even quantify right now. You know, Mary, if I can go one step further with that, what's interesting is at the local agency level, and I'm talking countywide, um, they're looking at very seriously at the sea level rise projections, and we are seeing legislation or policy being implemented about land or terrestrial, from a terrestrial environmental perspective, where right now you're looking at solid land, you're looking at farms, you're looking at businesses and homes. However, it is now being redesignated as a future wetland. And the laws that are being, and policies that are being implemented are saying, well, you're not going to be able to develop or build anymore because this is going to be a future wetland, so we don't want to have to retract everything that you're going to do. Um, and we're finding that as people are trying to, say, add a deck to their home, it's like, well, no, sorry, you're going to have to elevate, you're going to have to, or relocate, or not, you're not going to be permitted to do it at all. It's kind of intriguing. Mm. Well, that is very interesting. I actually have not heard of um, that kind of um, stance yet in too many localities. I mean, a, a lot of localities are just ignoring the problem. And, you know, it does seem harsh from the landowner's perspective because, and this is the classic problem with environmental law, for the individual landowner who wants to do something, like as simple as building a deck, these problems seem very far away. Um, there, now, what, what is interesting to me is so often local agencies will focus on the, the easier properties like private landowners, but they might ignore the industrial facilities. And... Um, in terms of priorities, if there's industrial facilities in that zone, they ought to relocate uh, because if they're going to actually be inundated by water, that's going to be a lot of contamination that's actually worse than the deck on the side of the house. Absolutely. I think we so have somebody. Are, yeah. Sorry. Well, there's just so much to do. I think agencies have to set good priorities <laughs> and focus on the, the real contamination threats. Liliana. Hello, good morning. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> I hope you are hearing me well. Uh, um, I'm very glad to, to join this Hangout. And uh, so thank you so much to add me. <laughs> where, are you, you. where are you calling from, Liliana? I am now living in Denver. I am a Brazilian. I work to the environmental agency there, our environmental institute. And uh, I am here in Denver after a time in Eugene. Eugene? Uh, yes. <laughs> I was at UFO. And, oh. uh, yes, very nice to meet you. And uh, I am now here in Denver after a time also on MIT. Great. So you worked okay. with the agency in Brazil. What were your reflections from that? Uh, I see a lot of differences. Um, between the way our uh, society is structured and the way that we see the public goods and uh, how 
uh, our environmental law is developing. So I think in, La in all Latin America, there are some difference uh, between there and U.S., and it's what I am researching here. Well, good. Do you have the problem with agency discretion that, that we talked about earlier? Yeah, I am the bad guys. I use the discretional power <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> So yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very hard to 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 just look, as you said, um, to try to make the the fair decision, because not always uh, the law is fair in all the views, and uh, so I think the participation and the public trust is the only way. Mm. Well, we try to incorporate these things, but uh, it's very hard sometimes. Yes, well, the, um, you know, some of the big issues down there have to do with the Amazon forest, for example. And um, I've described the Amazon in Chapter 10 of Nature's Trust, the Amazon forest, yeah. as a trust asset in itself. And if you look at the Amazon forest as one asset, the co-trustees are all the nations that manage that. Um, but the world has an interest in this sure. trust asset because the Amazon not only supports so much biodiversity, but it in effect is the lens of the planet. And if the Amazon um, turns into desert, which uh, some scientists say it, it will be savanna, um, under scenarios of global warming, if we don't control carbon dioxide pollution, that spells disaster for the planet because it actually um, has absorbed so much carbon dioxide pollution. And so that's an example of where your local agencies um, in governments that, that are the countries that hold the Amazon actually have a planetary trust responsibility. Um, and so it's a very interesting thing down there. And when we um, think of all the clear cutting of the Amazon, on one hand, the, the individual countries get the economic benefit, I suppose, um, although one could argue that ecotourism would provide more sustainable economies. Uh, but on the other hand, um, these economic benefits are so short lived compared to the damage um, that will, will not be able to be repaired. So you live in a very interesting area, and I hope you're doing good work on that uh, on that aspect. Yeah, and uh, something that um, I would like to ask is exactly how how do you perceive now these global governance? Uh, because the uh, law system at international level is something very difficult to deal with. Oh, I'm glad you asked that. Um, well, if we even look at, at global warming and carbon dioxide pollution, we see that every treaty process has failed. And for so long, um, government here in this country and in China, in all countries, we're saying we're not going to do anything domestically until we have an international agreement. But that in international agreement has never come about, and it's my um, proposition that it won't come about until you get domestic commitments. Mm -hmm. So we really have to start regulating carbon dioxide in this country and not wait for an international agreement because the same negotiators in the international agreement are, are basically from the administrations in their host countries. Mm -hmm. So they're subject to the same politicization problems. And uh, we've wasted years and years waiting for an international agreement. So the trust, I think, can provide a framework for international responsibility. And I've written about this in Chapter 10 of my book. And by providing a framework for international responsibility, individual countries can implement that framework. In other words, you can look at the atmosphere as one whole trust asset, identify a fiduciary obligation to protect it, and um, the scientist who you may have heard of, he's very famous, Jim Hansen, who was head of um, the um, NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, actually developed a prescription for the planet 
to lower carbon dioxide pollution, and that's uh, lowering by 6% a year the emissions on a global level. Well, if you take that global prescription, it provides a basis for individual countries through their court systems to hold governments accountable. In other words, you don't have to wait for an international agreement if you have a, a, a framework that looks at the atmosphere as a whole and what it needs for carbon dioxide reduction. Courts in individual countries could theoretically um, enforce that if the right lawsuits were brought. And mm -hmm. there is a, a, um, a, a whole litigation movement, which I'm not involved in, but I did map, map out where it could go, called Atmospheric Trust Litigation, mm -hmm. which seeks to do that. There's lawsuits brought in many of the states in the United States, and now there's lawyers bringing lawsuits in other countries that take this prescription of 6% reduction and try to um, ask for judicial enforcement in individual countries. So that is one way a trust concept could provide a measure of responsibility, just help define what is the responsibility for global assets if we don't have a global government, which we don't, mm -hmm. um, but we still have to have global responsibility. Uh, this is a, a good time for me to read uh, an email we got. It was posted from Lee. He had this to ask. Uh, he said he understood there was a Russian satellite called Cosmos 954, which re-entered the atmosphere. It was radioactive, and it was power. It was a nuclear powered. Had some nuclear power on it. It broke up over North America, and parts of it fell onto Canada uh, with radioactive material in Western Canada. And he wanted to know what, if anything, was the legal responsibility for it. And Lee, I can tell you, I actually uh, followed this a little bit when it happened. Uh, the country of Canada, citing the, the trail smelter case that we talked about, which was itself influenced by Tennessee Copper, one of the very first cases we opened our course with, uh, told the, so the Soviets at the time that no, they have responsibility for things they caused that occur over their borders, and the government of Canada billed the Soviet Union six million dollars for the cleanup of, of the satellite debris. Uh, the Russian government, uh, refu the Soviet government at that point had broken up, but before it broke up it paid half of it. It paid three million dollars, uh, but here's the kicker. Uh, that was nothing you might ask, what about the liability of the Soviet government for Chernobyl? <laughs> when you had the meltdown of the nuclear reactor that polluted a huge parts of other parts of the world, uh, the Soviet Union took the position that it owed nothing to anybody who was injured. Uh, and years later, when it, and the Soviet Union broke up and the problem really fell to the Ukrainian government, where the Chernobyl reactor was located, do you know what happened in the end to the Chernobyl reactor? Many of the countries of the world that were the victims of the pollution had to pay the Ukrainian government three billion dollars oh. to shut down Chernobyl. Uh, not an uncommon reaction, by the way, in the absence of legal regimes. So uh, we have a long way to go on countries' international responsibilities. Well, um, I might jump in there. I think that's a, a great explanation. Um, you know, we have Fukushima as well, which is the modern um, nuclear crisis, radioactive crisis, and, and radioactivity is coming to the shores of Oregon from that disaster. And I do think that countries um, usually don't want to pay for their environmental damage, but, but I actually think that there could be an international regime to start charging the industries. In other words, the countries themselves may not be the proper ones to pay. It's really the industries in those countries that cause the damages. And we have a doctrine um, that allows, the public trust doctrine allows natural resource damages against industry actors or any actors that cause, you know, very bad pollution to public resources. 
And this is used, for example, in domestic areas like the BP oil spill. They had to pay damages. The Exxon Valdez oil spill, they had to pay damages. So I think it wouldn't be that hard to create an international system of collecting the bill, if you will, from the industries that are polluting these resources. It would be a matter of going through the UN, setting up a system for charging natural resource damages and then getting it back to the origin country to clean it up. Um, but, it, but one of the problems is that these countries come together and negotiate and they assume that the citizens of the countries have to pay. Well, that's, that's not really fair. Um, and, and also we could apply this to carbon pollution. The industries that are causing this pollution, if they had to pay, um, we would get a lot more restoration um, of the atmosphere through reforestation and soil sequestration measures if we were actually billing the industries that were polluting the atmosphere. But instead what we do is we ask the countries to pay and th that really lands on the citizens. Um, could I jump in just quite quickly because uh, what you said um, just now we, we discussed in my uh, climate change module that I'm also taking uh, through Coursera and um, the professor there stated that um, this is sort of the result uh, of sort of the 19th, 20th century model of um, sort of national interests stay within national borders so every country is a little box and no box is about to interfere with another box so in this sense you need a sort of global paradigm change about what it means to be a citizen of a country, what it means to be a country and what mm -hmm. Uh, country interactions uh, entail for those countries and also third parties as well. So in this sense this is sort of a, I would say, a longer process that needs to be implemented um, maybe in tandem or separately uh, to this issue in order to be able to see changes. Yeah, I think that's a great comment um, and I've read, I've read things along those lines too and I just fully agree and I think more and more we're discovering that uh, we're planetary citizens and sometimes we, sometimes the citizens of, say, uh, West Virginia have more in common with the citizens down in Brazil than mm -hmm. they do with their own governments. Mm -hmm. Because really, citizens across the planet are facing this incredible environmental destruction in their communities yeah. that is allowed by their governments. And so they tend to form alliances now across the borders of, of nation states. And uh, I also had a question in relation to this because so far we've been talking about um, sort of imposing responsibility on uh, polluters and governments through this trust system. But I'd like to like uh, flip the table in, in a way and ask um, about the beneficiary side of it because mm -hmm. uh, when I studied uh, trust law uh, during my undergrad course, uh, undergrad um, law degree, um, we it, that was in England and they have quite a conservative approach to trust law and um, it took several years for the then uh, House of Lords to uh, s expand the definition of who could be a beneficiary of a trust but they did so in a limited way. They said that um, in order to be a beneficiary you had to fall it within an identifiable class. So in that sense, you're, they're still limiting the definition of who could be a beneficiary, whereas you're proposing that we sort of scrap the definition of um, beneficiary in a way and expand it to all the citizens of a country or potentially the whole world. So uh, I would just be curious to see how, um, whether you see any problems in implementing uh, this uh, public trust law, uh, maybe not in the US because uh, you seem to have a more advanced system of what a trust means and a public trust, but for example in other countries who either don't have a trust law based on the common law system or have a more conservative approach to the whole idea. Well, that's a great question. First as to the beneficiaries, the case law is really clear on this. Uh, in all countries that I've, I've looked at the case law, the beneficiaries are the citizens of the sovereign that you're challenging. Mm -hmm. So here in Oregon I would be a beneficiary of um, the, the public trust doctrine or the, the, the public trust assets in Oregon. But then if we're talking about the federal responsibility, it would be all U.S. citizens. So the global, this concept of a global trust is much less defined. Um, and that's where, where these classes really get difficult. Um, but I think you could fairly say that let's go back to Brazil and the Amazon since we were talking about that before. I think you could fairly say that 
um, citizens of any country actually um, also have planetary interests or global interests. So the citizens of Brazil um, not only have their local interests in the Amazon, but they also have their global interest in a healthy atmosphere that is supported by that forest. And so you could actually just fit this within the existing case law saying that when there's a public trust asset that has global ramifications, the local citizens actually represent those interests as well. Hmm. So, so that's one thing. But then you brought up another very, very good question that um, many legal scholars have, have thought about, and that is, uh, what do you do with countries that don't have an established system of hmm. trust? Well, my response is that really doesn't matter. The public trust is an expression of public ownership, and private trusts have always been a separate corner of the law. There are analogies, of course. The structure is the same. But the fact that a country doesn't have a well-elaborated system of private trust does not mean it doesn't have a public trust concept, because really what public trust means is public ownership. And most countries, most of those civil law countries, actually do have expressions of public ownership of waterways or beaches or whatever. Um, we must remember that the, the public ownership concept comes from Roman law, which influenced all the civil law countries. Mm -hmm. And so it, it might not be an exaggeration to say that the seeds of this trust concept are present in every country in the world because it's really a, a matter of a sovereign relationship between the citizens and the government. Now I don't think it would go over very well in totalitarian governments because as a principle of citizen populist um, sovereignty um, it, it just won't have any traction in totalitarian or fascist governments. So I don't expect it to do well there. But in governments that are principled democracies um, the trust, I've said many times, the trust is twin-born with democracy. It, it means the expectations of the citizens that the authority they give to their government won't be used against them in the depletion of the resources they need for survival. Well, you know, let me jump in at, at this point, uh, mostly because we have to sign off. But I can tell you there's no better way to sign off than with that last statement uh, from you, Mary. Okay. Uh, and, and in numerous ways. I mean, for one thing, I mean, this is remarkable. This is a course on environmental law with tw over 20, almost 24,000 people, 70% of whom are overseas from the United States. Uh, and to be doing this uh, in a way that is accessible to all of them, and, and to have right here on our particular uh, show, <laughs> uh, you know, Yuli from Venezuela and Kati from Hungary, Liliana from Brazil, Carmen from the East Coast of the United States, and of course you, Mary, over on the West Coast of the United States is, is well, it's perfect, actually. <laughs> so Mary, thank you on behalf of, of all of us here, and frankly on behalf of the 24,000 of us worldwide for being our first guest and just for being who you are, uh, just an inspiration. Uh, thank you so much, you all, and, and um, keep up your good work, and I very much appreciate being part of this class. It was a marvelous experience, and you've really been a pioneer in bringing environmental law to the world, uh, Professor Hornstein, so thank you. I'll sign off. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, and thank you. So long. Bye.